9-11 and Bush's war on terrorism. There's two interrelated questions that we want to explore. The first one is whether the 9-11 attack was preventable. And the second one was the way uh, the Bush administration hijacked 9-11 uh, to implement its preconceived plan for a global hegemony. Now there's no disputing the fact that there was this evil brilliance uh, behind the World Trade Center uh, attack. Uh, we need to understand this attack in terms of a string of increasingly aggressive and sophisticated attacks uh, by bin Laden and his al-Qaeda organization. So <laughs> the story really starts uh, in Soviet Afghanistan where Osama bin Laden, a rich playboy and heir uh, to the uh, bin Laden fortune, uh, was essentially helping uh, the Mujahideen fight the uh, Soviet uh, communists. Uh, once the Soviet Union withdrew from Afghanistan, Bin Laden returned to Saudi Arabia as a hero, but he quickly ran afoul with the royal house of Saud, in particular when uh, Saddam started to rattle his uh, sword, even brought tanks into Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Saudi House reached out to the United States for help. And from Osama bin Laden's perspective, uh, this was uh, illegitimate and American troops should not be in the Holy Land of Mecca and Medina. Uh, now, essentially, there's this kind of this evolution where bin Laden is, escapes into exile. He's persona non grata. And, Saudi Arabia's passport is taken over, and he begins uh, to issue a fatwa against the United States. He argues that the corruption and the suffering of Muslims is related to Western interference, and the United States is the head of the snake. Uh, therefore, he uh, tries to launch uh, attacks against American interests to get the United States to rethink its foreign policy and its support uh, for people like the House of Saad or uh, secular leaders like Mubarak in Egypt that are crushing uh, Islamic uh, political movements. So the first attack is really in Somalia in 1993. It was made famous by uh, the film uh, Black Hawk Down. Uh, one of the conclusions that Osama bin Laden drew from this uh, event is that if you kick the United States in the teeth, uh, the United States no longer was as resilient as it was in the Cold War and they would withdraw from uh, the Middle East. So starting in 1998, he began a, a series of attacks against lightly defended American interests, uh, barracks in Saudi Arabia, embassies in uh, East Africa, eventually uh, the USS Cole in uh, Aden. And this brought Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda into the United States' uh, attention. In fact, uh, by 2000, at the end of the second Clinton term, uh, they had developed quite a file on bin Laden. They were targeting and they even launched a missile strike in Afghanistan uh, that barely missed its target. Now, Clinton did not want to launch a, a major war at the end of his regime. Uh, he identified al-Qaeda as a major threat to U.S. interests. With his uh, counterterrorism czar, uh, Dick Clark, they developed an uh, ambitious counterterrorism strategy. And Dick Clark would stay on in the new Bush administration, and the idea was that he would take uh, the developed plans of the Clinton administration and turn those over uh, to the new uh, Bush team. However, when Bush took office, he was accompanied by two wily veterans of uh, the Cold War, both uh, Don Cheney and Dick Rumsfeld. Both these figures were hawks. Uh, they uh, also uh, looked at the world in a kind of Cold War lens. Uh, 
And they already had well-developed ideas about what the United States needed to do in the post-Cold War world. As a result, when Dick Clark came knocking on their doors and warned them about Al-Qaeda, they essentially laughed him off. And the main reason for that was is they had already developed their grand strategy, which was the, the plan for the new American century. I'll explain in a few minutes. And central to this uh, strategy was to prevent China from replacing Russia as a uh, major rival to the United States. From this perspective, non-state actors, terrorist attacks, although they could be annoying, were not a major existential threat. So the result of this attitude from above in Washington from the veteran uh, Bush team is that a lot of intelligence and noise that was announcing the potential not only for an Islamist attack on U.S. soil but the use of airplanes as a delivery vehicle was systematically ignored. And I think the weight of the evidence is, if you look at it carefully, is that if uh, standard police procedures were pursued, the Americans would have uh, come upon the evidence that potentially would have enabled them to thwart the 9-11 attack. Uh, now, there's many examples that I could point to. Uh, one is that the CIA had uh, uh, the 9-11, two members of the 9-11 uh, conspiracy uh, under surveillance and never informed uh, the FBI uh, to keep them under surveillance in Los Angeles. Now, if they'd done that, they would have probably been led uh, to the conspiracy. Uh, the NSA that had a very sophisticated surveillance operation, uh, as it turned out, they had intercepted intelligence uh, that would have led them to the 9-11 plot but they suffered from a lack of translators, so the intelligence that would have informed them of that was still in process and had it been transferred, uh, tr translated in time for them to thwart the attack. And you know, there, were, there was a lot of chatter. Uh, there had been chatter already for many years about Islamists intending to hijack planes and send them uh, into to buildings. So when Bush said, you know, this attack just couldn't have been anticipated, uh, this is a direct uh, contradiction of the rumors that were circulating in these Islamist cells that the Americans uh, were monitoring. And perhaps the most damning evidence is uh, this man, um, Sawi, a French jihadist. Uh, his uh, trainer, he was in pilot school in the Twin Cities, called the FBI and said, you know, this guy's got a screw loose. I don't know what's wrong with him, but he, he really gives me bad vibes. He doesn't want to learn how to land the plane. He just wants to learn you know, how to fly it. So the FBI got involved. They sent a case officer to look into Misawi. This rang a lot of uh, alarm bells. And the case officer went to his superiors and said, you know, we got to look into this. But his superiors had other priorities. The agent was convinced enough that there was something wrong that he went over his boss's head and called you know, the headquarters in, in Washington and said, look, we got to look and see if there's any other jihadis in American flight schools. And there was actually uh, jihadis training in Florida. And, you know, see if there's any others involved, that there might be a plot here. But he was ignored. Uh, he was reprimanded. And the result was, you know, two days before 9-11, Condoleezza Rice, the, the national security advisor for the Bush administration, uh, essentially eight months after Bush uh, took office, for the first time she meets with Dick Clark and, you know, she's kind of exposed in, in, in to, the, to, to Bin Laden and, and the Nine uh, and to the, the Al-Qaeda uh, network. Uh, and I guess, you know, my perspective is the way the evidence shows that, you know, 9-11, if it, may, maybe we can't say it should have been prevented, but it definitely could have been prevented. And definitely the evidence suggests uh, that at the very least. Now, there was certainly uh, an evil brilliance to the September uh, 11 uh, plot. Uh, the, the, the plot would really didn't require a lot of organization or, or money, probably less than $200,000. Uh, 
Uh, it was a plot that was run by Al-Qaeda, which essentially in Arabic means the foundation. And what it essentially was was the alumni network of uh, Arab Afghans. In other words, uh, Arab fighters that had fought the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. They were Mujahideen. They were holy warriors. And after the Soviet Union left, they, they kind of kept into contact. So when Osama bin Laden went back to Afghanistan, he reestablished this uh, alumni network. He called it Al-Qaeda, or the base. And uh, KSM Sheikh Mohammed, a Pakistani, uh, was essentially the brainchild of the plot. Uh, bin Laden was essentially uh, the money man that provided the financing for it. The basic scheme was to uh, smuggle in uh, 20 uh, Arab suicide bombers. Most of them were Saudis because one of the kind of side objectives of the plot was to drive a wedge between the Saudis and uh, the Americans, particularly the House of Saud and the House of Bush were very close uh, together. Uh, this was actually very easy to do. There was you know, a lot of rumors that they had to come in through Canada, but actually that was not even necessary. It was very easy for an open society like the United States with lots of universities for uh, these individuals to come into the United States without any major uh, security uh, checks. Now, uh, the basic idea was you could create a devastating uh, missile attack by hijacking a plane. Now, there was a whole protocol for dealing with hijacked planes. Usually they were held for ransom. That's what the PLO had traditionally done. Uh, but in Al-Qaeda's case, the, the kind of the novel invention is that they would be suicide bombers. They would use the aircraft's uh, controls to transform it into a missile. They were going to hijack transcontinental planes that would be laden with fuel early in their flight. So the fuel itself would be the explosives or the payload that they would deliver on four strategic targets that were intentionally uh, you know, selected to send a message. Now given the, the level of security, it was actually very easy to overpower these planes. It only took uh, essentially uh, five agents, five uh, hijackers, fitted with box cutters, some basic martial arts training. They easily overpowered the crew. Uh, there was no real security door between the plane and the cockpit, so it was an easy measure of taking over the plane, especially as the security protocol at the time uh, preached collaborating uh, with uh, the hijackers because there had been no attempt to hijack and use it as a, as a, as a guided missile. Now there was a you know a security network, and when you can see here's a picture in Logan Airport of Mohammed Atta, the the operational commander of the 9-11 attack going through uh, security. He didn't ring any alarm bells. He was an MA student from Egypt. Uh, but there were two Saudis that really triggered the alarm bells of uh, security personnel. And uh, they, they, they looked on the database, but the database was very incomplete. There was actually files on these guys, but the various branches of security service weren't talking to each other. So they knew there was something wrong with them, but they had no means or power to stop them, so they allowed the hijackers to board the plane, and of course they hijacked it and sent it into uh, the World Trade Center, uh, as we know. So in general, this was an ingenious attack, but it was an attack that was made possible by very lax security measures, and certainly one of the good outcomes of 9-11 is that airport security has become you know, a lot more uh, uh, high, and this has prevented uh, successor uh, attacks. Uh, ever from happening uh, again. I remember being in uh, New York when the uh, first tower was hit. Uh, I was actually teaching class and uh, someone came in and said you have to turn on television. There was actually televisions in the classroom. We turned them on. We could see the, you know, the World Trade Center, the first tower burning, and then you know, quite soon another, another plane crashed into the other towers. You know, pretty clear that there was something going on. This was something nefarious. It was not just a, you know, an accident. Uh, the protocol for uh, this type of accident, a plane collision with a building, is to contain the fire. So in New York, Manhattan, uh, first responders, which is you know the police, firemen, uh, you know, paramedics, 
uh, they would rush to the side, try to contain the fire and help the people uh, that were wounded. Uh, but the World Trade Center uh, building was relatively uh, unique. And it was kind of built as a shell with this kind of steel grid. And what happened is uh, when the plane struck and the kerosene burned really hot, it critically weakened the steel girders. And there's a certain point where uh, they so weaken that uh, the floor collapses and this sets off a chain of dominoes where the building literally collapses into itself and its footprint. There's almost nothing left except for a cloud of you know, dust of you know, glass and, and, and steel. Anyway, when the first responders were moving up to contain the fire, a structural engineer arrived and he said, oh no, this is a problem, this building is going down. He knew this pretty much 15 minutes before it happened. And they tried to, you know, desperately, you know, get to the building evacuated, not just the people on the lower floors, but the first responders that were busily moving up the stairs, and they just couldn't get through, which is very tragic. Uh, so a lot of the victims on, you know, 9-11 were actually first responders doing their duty, and they could have been saved if the communications had been uh, better. It was one of the, the cuts of Rudy Giuliani, who had later, you know, kind of sell himself as America's major uh, mayor, uh, you know, a hero of 9-11, but as, as a Republican cutting costs, he had cut uh, the, the budget that had been uh, appropriated to modernize these uh, communications. President Bush was, meanwhile, in Florida reading to a bunch of uh, kindergartners a book called uh, My Pet Goat. Uh, yeah, there's actually footage of it. You can see they come whisper in his ear after the first attack. He gets a little bit ashen, but he doesn't know what has happened. Uh, it's, it's, it's unclear to everyone. After the second strike, he evacuates. Uh, they, they're worried that he might be uh, a target. So when the first uh, tower uh, collapses, you know, most Americans were now tuned into television, and we saw it, you know, fall down and collapse and. Uh, you know, less than an hour later, the second tower uh, collapsed for the same reasons uh, again. That this uh, you know, burning, very hot fire uh, broke the structural core of the building, triggering its collapse. Which is not something that actually Osama bin Laden had anticipated. It was really a, a lucky strike, and it was something that was particular to this particular uh, building. Now, in addition to uh, the World Trade. Uh, center towers, the Twin Towers. There was also a strike on the Pentagon, which hit its target, causing 125 uh, casualties. The fourth plane, uh, they ran a little bit behind. It was UA Flight 93. Uh, one of the things, uh, one of the mistakes that the hijackers made is they didn't confiscate people's phones. So by the time that they hijacked the plane and were sending it probably to the White House, uh, the, the passengers uh, understood this was a terrorist attack, they were going to die anyway, and the crew uh, essentially launched an attack on the cockpit. They used uh, the drink cart as a battering ram, they broke through the cockpit, overpowered uh, the pilots, and we think they you know, brought the, the, uh, the plane down in Pennsylvania before it could uh, return to Washington. One of the things that's important uh, to remember, uh, for those of you that weren't yet born on 9-11 or very young, is how afraid uh, that people were. Uh, you know, this attack was really unprecedented. There had been terrorist attacks before, but mostly you know, in the Middle East, vulnerable places, never on uh, you know, essentially home s uh, soil. And it wasn't just on home soil, it was just the scale of the attack. You know, they threw 1,000 deaths. Uh, you know, major buildings collapse, a uh, shock to the stock market. So, you know, this was a, you know, one of the, essentially the, the, one of the most major, uh, you know, jihadist attacks in, in, in history of the 20th century. Uh, and it kind of happened in a location where, you know, Americans basically believed that they were safe on their home soil. This kind of fit into American history. Traditionally, we were separated by uh, vast oceans and uh, you know, even when war ravaged Europe or Asia, you know, we were essentially uh, secure. Uh, there was another element of it as well. Uh, for those watching on television and witnessing it live, uh, this image of the World Trade Center collapsing, this horror, was replayed again and again. And uh, you know, this kind of triggered a high degree of, of fear. Uh, 
Uh, Ernst Becker has written uh, about this, the denial of death. Uh, as, as humans, we are on the top of the animal kingdom and unique because we have consciousness. We can visualize our own death. As a result, uh, we are living constantly in terror. And, and one of the ways that we deal with this terror and push it out of mind is, you know, basically to, to create a culture and uh, push death into a distance and hide it away in you know, uh, these various uh, centers. And as a result, uh, you know, a skyscraper is a symbol of our civilization, and when it collapses, it highlights our vulnerability uh, that we can be attacked uh, and that we're going to eventually die. So this is what a, you know, a terror attack is. A terror is the fear without a face. If you have you know, someone you know, coming to attack you, that's a real and present uh, you know, danger. Here's a mugger that's coming. Uh, what anxiety is, or terror, is you know, uh, kind of a non-localized fear, a feeling of vulnerability, total vulnerability, not knowing who the enemy is, what they want, what their potential is, when they can strike, how bad it might be. And you know, this was really the condition, the psyche of Americans after 9-11. Uh, no one had heard about bin Laden, uh, Al-Qaeda, no one had heard of this. Uh, it wasn't clear who bin Laden was, why he had attacked, you know, Americans on their home soil, civilians largely killed. Uh, in addition, uh, it was uh, widely presented that this was not just a one-off attack, but, you know, Al-Qaeda was this massive organization with all these sleeper cells that were operating, and this was only a precursor attack. And, you know, they were trying to get a hold of nuclear weapons. Uh, quite soon, there was a, another attack, an anthrax scare. Anthrax is a, you know, a deadly uh, toxin. It's a kind of a, a fungus uh, manufactured by a, by a lab. And uh, several uh, anthrax envelopes were sent to American politicians. Uh, now, they mostly did not achieve, uh, they did not kill the politicians that targeted them. Uh, but what did happen is that when they went through the post, the tiny spores went through the postal system and they ended up in other mail. So, you know, there was like this unfortunate uh, Connecticut school teacher that got a postcard, contracted anthrax, and died. So it, it was really kind of a random event, but it highlighted you know, how no one was safe. Anyone could die. We didn't know the enemy, what their capability was, what they wanted. And, you know, this really made people afraid. Whenever people would start to relax and, you know, start to feel a little bit more secure, the Bush administration would come online and, you know, they would start to uh, amplify uh, the dangers. Uh, they came out one after the other, uh, basically talking about, you know, 9-11 changed everything. Uh, this was only the first attack. Uh, continually talking about mushroom clouds over American cities. Things are much, much worse. We we got to respond. We got to change the, the way that we uh, do business. Otherwise, the the results will be catastrophic. So the mantra of the Bush administration uh, was that 9/11 changed everything. And you know, it was whether it was Cheney or Rumsfeld or Rice or Bush, uh, they were all making uh, the rounds. And uh, they were arguing that America needs to change. We, in this age of you know, being attacked by terrorists in our home soil, we'll never be safe unless we change the way uh, that we operate. Uh, so you know, one of the ways they start to talk about the world is, again, in the Cold War terms of a struggle between good and evil. You're either with us or you're against us. Uh, so everyone needed to follow the U.S. to prevent uh, another uh, terrorist attack. And the enemy was uh, novel. It was not an, an enemy state. These were non-state actors. Al-Qaeda was just a very loose network. Uh, so, you know, there was really no way to interdict that. Uh, yeah, you could go to Afghanistan and you could root them up from their training camps, but you had to essentially uh, deal with the state sponsors, the groups that provided support and nurturing to these uh, terrorist uh, groups. Uh, accordingly, with this, this danger and you know, these jihadis trying to you know, get nuclear weapons, uh, 
uh, you, we couldn't afford to draw distinctions between the terrorists who launched the attack versus you know, the states like Syria or North Korea that might be giving them uh, assistance. We had to go after the terrorist sponsors to create an environment where you know, essentially these terrorist groups would have no refuge. Uh, so another very novel idea uh, that the Bush administration came out with was the idea of preemption. Uh, now, it's, it seemed reasonable if you were very afraid about a terrorist attack or these, if you believe that these jihadis were trying to get a hold of nuclear weapons and to unleash them over American soil, the idea was you had to preempt uh, the, the, the jihadis from getting these nuclear weapons. So what you needed to do is if you knew there was a, you know, a, a state like uh, North Korea or Iraq that was interested in acquiring uh, weapons of mass destruction, you would have to overthrow this regime because they might eventually give this uh, weapon of mass destruction to uh, al-Qaeda or the terrorists. So this was called preemption, but this was you know, really a slippery slope because you didn't need to have you know, any evidence of collusion between you know, Saddam Hussein and al-Qaeda. Uh, you didn't have to have any evidence that Saddam Hussein actually had nuclear weapons. Uh, preemption basically meant that if you believe that Saddam might be getting or might be interested in getting you know, biological weapons or had shown interest this in the past or maybe thwarted weapons inspectors for some reason, well, you knew then that he could eventually potentially give it to some other group who might use it against you. you know, with this type of logic, you could justify the invasion of any country. So rather than you know, war being an instrument of national defense, essentially it's, it's giving the, the, the Bush administration carte blanche to attack any country that they deem to be an enemy. And this was all justified because 9-11 you know, had changed everything. We're now fighting a war on terrorism. We no longer have to follow international law. We don't have to prove that Saddam has you know, weapons of mass destruction. We've got to take them out just to make America safe. Otherwise, you know, you're going to die of a nuclear uh, attack. Now, uh, you might wonder, you know, why did the Bush administration suddenly make, you know, Al-Qaeda to be this, like, super organization that was super scary when they spent the first eight months of the administration basically doing nothing about them? Well, the reason was is that they were essentially hijacking 9-11 and the horror of 9-11, the fears that Americans felt and the fears that were amplified by their administration to justify a preconceived plan uh, to remake American military power and use it to spread American influence, in particular to take on uh, North Korea, Iran, and Iraq and create regime uh, change there. So the Bush Doctrine was essentially this, this new foreign policy, very radical reorientation. They basically got rid of you know, the whole architecture of the rules-based order the United States had played such a big role in establishing after World War II. Uh, they used it first to you know, topple the Taliban, which was reasonable because al-Qaeda came from the Taliban, but immediately they redeployed to attack Saddam Hussein and to invade uh, Iraq. Now, one of the mantras of the Bush administration was that 9-11 uh, changed everything, that we had to change the way our military and foreign policy operated because the tools that we'd inherited from the 20th century really no longer worked in this new global world where you had you know, non-state actors like al-Qaeda. So one of the things we needed to think about after 9-11 is, you know, did 9-11 change everything? Uh, one of the arguments that Cheney made uh, was that you know, the Americans needed to go uh, to the dark side to keep Americans safe. And you know, this meant, to a certain degree, the use of uh, torture as an interrogation technique. Uh, this resulted in torture at Abu Ghraib in Iraq and also in Guantanamo, which was an illegal uh, procedure outside the confines of international law. It also meant expanding the security state to snoop on Americans in order to interdict uh, terrorists and uh, stop these networks from doing successor uh, attacks. Uh, so 9-11 did result in a change uh, in Western uh, societies and I think for the most part most Canadians who are really worried about the surveillance state and some of these mechanisms uh, 
uh, felt that they were justified because they worked. They, for, most, for the most part, prevented a sequel attack from an organized jihadi uh, cell. Uh, the only attacks that were really had on Canadian American souls subsequent to that, there were a few attacks uh, by ISIS and uh, Al Qaeda in, in Europe, in uh, Madrid, for example. But most of the attacks were lone wolf attacks by alienated individuals with only really a tangential connection uh, to formal uh, jihadi uh, networks. So in conclusion, the 9-11 the attack uh, was very much telegraphed years before. Uh, it certainly could have been prevented. You might even argue it could have been prevented if the United States had followed a you know, I paid more attention to Al-Qaeda, put more resources there, followed some clues that would have led them to the conspiracy. Now, the Bush administration hijacked 9-11 to and even amplified the fear in various ways about a nuclear attack for which they had no evidence because they, they were going to use 9-11 to reformulate U.S. foreign policy. The Bush doctrine uh, was going to justify what they wanted to do, which was to expand American power and take on rogue states like North Korea, Iran, and uh, Iraq. So the Bush administration really lied about weapons of mass destruction, and they uh, spent all these narratives to convince the Americans that not only did we need to go into Afghanistan, but now we had to somehow uh, remove Saddam Hussein in Iraq when there was absolutely no connection between the two, nor even any uh, real evidence between the two. And this was all part of a preconceived plan that I'm going to explain in the next video.